yeah, yeah. What's up? What's going on? It is BQ. It is the lounge, and it's the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. Thanks for swinging by. We're going to talk a little bit Impact. Um, it is Tuesday. It is later. And um, I had a really busy week last week, and then I had my daughter's high school graduation Saturday. But even with that being said, there was a workaround. I was I planned on getting the show done, but um, I actually threw my back out on the weekend. Uh, loading a so we had a big dumpster that we rented to clean out the garage and I mean it came down to the last box that I picked up that I was moving that I thought was empty and it was all back and just completely threw my back out and I could not walk for like three days I was in a lot a lot of pain so um that threw me off a little bit as well so we're doing a, a Tuesday show here and we're gonna talk a, a pretty good episode of impact. As I always say, if it's good, I'm going to tell you if it's good. If it's bad, I'm going to tell you it's bad. You know, and I had one of the the Twitter you know, conversations today with, you know, you don't like anything and all you ever do is knock everything they do. But that is not true. Like, if you know me, you know my mission, you know what I do, you know, um, especially if you know me from the beginning, you, you know what my intentions always have been. And it's to want to see the company do better to see it improve, to see it grow. But with that, I'm doing my part in holding them accountable when something isn't good. And, you know, the argument was over the digital media championship. There's very little positive that you can say about that title. So if I'm saying something negative about this title, that does not mean that my mission is to put down every single thing that impact wrestling does because that is not the case i don't want to put down anything that they do but there are things that i think they continue to do that i don't like and there's things they do that they that i do like and i'm always gonna point that out because at the end of the day i want this company to do well i uh want to see it succeed I want to see more and more wrestlers want to come to the company. And that's what, you know, that's what it all boils down to. And I think there's a lot of wrestling fans out there who don't watch sports. Because, um, you know, especially if you're my Facebook friend, like, you know, I'm a fucking basketball nut. NBA, WNBA, like, you know, I'm a nut. And, you know, I watch football and, and a little bit of baseball, too. But with becoming with being a fan and you watch your team go out there and play terribly, you don't get on social media the next day and, oh, well, you know, they gave it their all and uh, there were some good moments and they played good for one of the four quarters. You know what I mean? Like, you don't do that. If you're a real sports fan, and I treat Impact no different than that, if there's if there's something that they're doing that I don't think works, and it doesn't matter that I'm not in the industry because I have my own experience in my own areas, and I may not be in the wrestling business, but I have eyes, I have ears, and I have different types of experience that still qualify me to have an opinion. We can all have opinions, but if you are going to be one of those fans that likes everything they do, you know... You're one of those fans that's actually very damaging for the company. And if Scott Demore wants to satisfy those fans, the ones who like everything, then sooner than later, he's going to go from being vice or being president to being a fan because Impact will be out of business and he'll be watching it just like they are. Now, do I think it's going that direction? No, I'm just making a point. Um, You have to hold them accountable as a fan, whether, you know, it's a sports team, whether it's wrestling. If something isn't good, if it isn't working, you have to hold them accountable. And when it is good, then get excited. We should get excited about what is good, okay? So every few months, I have to give that kind of spiel. It was no different than when TW was sitting here with me. We, we would do the same thing and always point out because we have the new listeners that come and and everything. And then some people who've only been listening for a short period of time. So we have to... Uh, say those things to let you know if it's good we'll say if it's it's good if it's bad we'll say it's bad you feel me on that 
So um, we're gonna. I'm gonna get into this episode. It was a good show. The uh, I said last week that I thought last week's was the best show of the year. The previous couple shows to that I did not really like, uh, but I thought they did a pretty decent one here. Um, and uh, as a reminder, if you're on the Patreon, we will be pausing billing in June, July, and August. What does that mean for you guys here on YouTube? And I'm sorry that I'm repeating myself for those of you who check me out every single week, uh, but I am working on my move from Southern Illinois to the Las Vegas area. And there's a lot that comes with that. And I cannot have the pressure of having to do a Patreon, having to do a podcast. I have to take a break. Now in June, it is possible here on the YouTube that I still will review the show or at least review a couple because I'll still be in Illinois at that time. But July 1st, I'm outie and uh, I'm staying in an Airbnb for a month uh, while we house hunt. And then we're going to be moving into a house. So July, August, probably here on the channel, you're not going to get anything from me because I'm not even going to have a setup to do it. So um, I am throwing that out there. Um, and I'm going to have to throw it out there every week until I actually take that break, that hiatus. So I will do some kind of video on the YouTube to remind people that I'm just simply taking a break and that I will be back. But I got to do what I got to do for my personal life. Um, yeah, so that's all I got to say about that. Um, I did have this article up. I guess I took it down. Impact is doing a press release for Under Siege. And... I don't know what this press release means, or a press conference, I should say. And I don't know if this means there's actual wrestling journalists involved. Uh, they like to get on uh, Skype and have podcasters with 10 subscribers come on and ask questions. It, it's really odd because I had this article up and then I took it down. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it up while I'm, while I'm talking to you here. But it's really odd because they're not promoting the big dogs of Impact Wrestling. Uh, here we go. So the press conference is Impact Wrestling announces major, major press conference on Thursday, May 25th to preview the showcase event. Is that what they're calling these? The monthly special showcase events? I can live with that. I think that's good branding. I think that's not what they're calling. I think that's just how they're referring to it in this article. But uh, under siege, it'll air live Friday, May 26th. And I did preview this show on the Patreon, by the way, and give you my predictions. Um, from Western Fair District, uh, Argoplex in London, Ontario, streaming on Impact Plus, YouTube for Ultimate Insiders, and Fight. So the graphic is here, and uh, the faces that they have chosen for this press conference are Brian Myers, The Good Hands, Santino Morella, and Tyler Turva. He's going to speak on his future. If you do not know who this is, um, let me make sure I'm saying his name correct, because I'm, I'm saying that off the top of my head. Uh, let's go over here. Under siege. Tyler Turva, yep. He will discuss his pro wrestling future. If you do not know who this is, this was the runner-up to Jackson Stone on... Uh, a gut check like three or four years ago. Okay. I didn't know who the hell this was at first, but then uh, my boy Lewis reminded me and I was like, that's right. Because I thought he should have won. Now this whole, what they try to put off as a reality show was horrible. Uh, they had, there was a lot of potential for them to do something, uh, a whole YouTube series to get people to buy into the wrestlers and to understand who they were and to want to see someone win. They didn't do that. They gave little clips. Uh, but the final ended up being Tyler Turva versus Jackson stone on TV. And I, you know, I thought he should have won. Like I, I saw something in him. I think he called himself the Saturday night delight or something like that. But I saw something in him. They went with Jackson stone. Jackson stone has wrestled less than five times on TV uh, ever since then. So I have a hard time thinking we're supposed to get excited about the runner up from gut check 2018 or 19, whatever the hell it was. 
it's got to be over three years ago because it wasn't during the pandemic, I don't think. So I want to say it's got to be four years at this point. I think it's it had to have been 2019. So I don't know how we're supposed to get excited about this, but, you know, let's have an open mind because because maybe um, maybe you're going to do something with them. I have no problem with Impact bringing in guys we haven't heard of before or that the majority of the wrestling fans haven't heard of. But bring them in and do something with them. I'm not saying challenge for the X Division Championship the next week. But when you see Killer Kelly debut, you see Masha debut, you see Jody Threat debut. They are running through jobbers. They are showing us what they can do. Showing us their move set. Because what I always talk about, what's this person's finisher? What's, you know, how would this person even win a match if they're going to win a match? They bring too many people in and they lose immediately especially these newer guys. And I think they're trying to do like a young lion system, but that doesn't work in the United States. That's what, that's what I feel like they're, they're trying to do something like that. But so it's okay. I have no problem. Not, I mean, shit, I grew up in the eighties. They, Hey, this is the debut of, you know, jo- Johnny jiggle nuts. And I, I'd never seen him wrestle before, but I was intrigued to see what he could do. You know, so it's okay. We don't have to know people, but bring them in and do something with them. Don't don't job them immediately. Because think of uh, Sheldon Jean. Like he looks like he's got a lot of potential, but he just comes on and loses all the time. Like what are we supposed to get excited about with him? You understand what I'm talking about? So let us get into this episode of Impact again. I thought it was a pretty solid episode. B, uh, BTI did not watch it. I will go back at some point because mainly because I want I just want to hear Jade do the ring announcing. I don't care about the Diener and the con and the angels versus the swinger and the dice. I do not care about that, but I do want to hear the ring announcing, which I think continues to be a weak part of the show. I do think he's uh Penter's been sounding a little better lately. It does sound like he is trying to put a little a little, you know little jump in a step and, and, you know, uh, give some life to some of these uh, entrances that he does and trying to make some of them sound different. You know, Kylan Kings, for instance, I thought he, that sounded really good. Uh, Jabba Morris was bad. So it's, it's just, it's just kind of all over the place, but I do hear some improvement, but I would love to hear Jade step into this role eventually. So this kicks off with, Trey Miguel versus Laredo Kid. Laredo Kid uh, recently said that he's a free agent, and then he took the tweet down. I, I mean, why should we care anyway? They've done absolutely nothing with him. He's in the category of people who don't win any matches. He just comes in and has good ma- has good matches, uh, but he doesn't win any, any of them. So he's fun to watch, but you know that he was never going to be X Division champion, or you know this is not some big loss if he he doesn't stick around, but. We do enjoy what we see of him when we see him. And he took on Trey Miguel. I think Trey does stand. Uh, I think there's a high probability he drops the X Division Championship to Chris Saban. Um, between him and Alex Shelley, one of these two are winning at Under Siege. I'm, I feel very good about that. I don't think both of them are losing. So the X Division Championship is that title that always change hands when we don't expect it. Because they'll put it on someone who were like, oh man, they they should have a nice long reign, you know, the Chris Bays, the the uh, uh, Ace Austin, uh, Trey Miguel's had this title multiple times, and we keep thinking, okay, they're gonna have a long run, and then it's like drop it out of nowhere. I see that happening here, so we'll see. But this was a really good opener, and I just think Trey is has been a great heel, and I want to see him. I do want to see him um, because one of the reasons I think he could lose his titles because I'd love to see him get out of the X division and start wrestling for the world title. So if you look at the AEW world title scene, it's four pretty small dudes wrestling for the world title. You know, we can get him there. Uh, But yeah, he wins. He he pulls off Laredo's mask and he uh, he rolls him up. He gets the win. Tom Hannafin is beside himself. This dirty, dastardly deeds i will say this i thought the episode looked a little better i thought the lighting was better and um you know if you think i'm negative bq with impact i've never reviewed an episode of AEW. 
you want to hear negative, I don't like anything on that show. I still watch it every week because I, I desire, I have a desire for watching a big arena wrestling show. That that is really what it boils down to. Watching Impact's been real fun over the years. You know, I had I got a real little strong little run with NWA for a while, but I desire to watch a big arena wrestling show, and I don't like NXT, which that's not huge, but um, and I'm not gonna watch WWE. So AEW is what I watch. I would destroy it if I was podcasting and covering it because that show sucks. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I just made a comment about Impact's lighting and I said it looked a little bit better. It's got a long way to go. I think that the show not being in HD is, um, there's no excuse for it at this time, you know? And I don't know if it's an Access TV thing. I know that exporting a hard def- uh, high definition file takes a very, very, very long time. Uh, but I just don't think there's an excuse right now. Because I, I watched one of those main event Monday matches and it was in gorgeous high definition. You know, the show, if it were in HD, all these little lighting things we're talking about, the 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 filters, the color correction, the actual lights themselves, we wouldn't notice those things if it was in high definition. Because that accounts for a lot when it comes to lighting. When the lower the resolution the worse all these little color corrections and and things are because uh, it it doesn't support the colors. The lower you, uh, you know, the higher higher definition it's in supports every single color under the damn rainbow. But you start, okay, we're going to export it to this file. We're going to lose quality. It doesn't support all these colors, and that's why they blend together and they look like shit. But to go back to what I'm saying about AEW, Like, this show fucking sucks ass, people. And the people still watch it because it looks great. And that accounts for a lot. That makes up a lot. If the show looks good, it's going to make up for it not being good. People are going to associate something that looks bad with being bad. You know, so I thought the episode looked a little bit better. It, It wasn't perfect, but it looked better. So yeah, Trey Miguel gets this win. Really fun little opener. Um, and then he has a hey, uh, him and Chris Saban have a segment after that in the ring that I thought was really good too. Um, at first, Saban started doing the you know AJ Styles Samoa job. I'm like, here we fucking go again, you know, uh, with this with the Kurt Angle. But then he's bringing up Josh Alexander. He's bringing up Chris. I mean, Chris Rich Swan. He is. Uh, he's listing X Division champions that we're familiar with in the Access TV era. So I thought that was that was really good because I don't even think the crowd cares about that anymore. When you start listing all those names, because everybody fucking does it. So um, they had a really nice little confrontation here. I think Saban's going to beat him because the, excuse me, the Motor City Machine Guns, we just, what are they going to do at this point? You know, they were just champ, just the tag team champions. Someone else needs some shine in that division. So I see them doing some single stuff. There's still the, the guns at the end of the day, but I see them doing some single stuff. All right. So then, um, we get Trinity early on, and uh, Jay Vidal has come up and said that Giselle Shaw was not happy about the selfie he posted. Well, Jay's the one that took the picture. This was the match that I said that I predicted was gonna be, was gonna happen when they said there was an open contract for Trinity. I said it's very likely gonna be be Giselle Shaw. She's not doing anything. We're not seeing her on TV. I think she might have been injured, but I was fairly certain. That's who they were going to use. And they feed her to a lot of people. You know, I think she has a lot of potential as the X, as the X division. Uh, that would be interesting. As the knockouts champion. But um, they don't see her like that right now. And she, she's doing a lot of losing. And Trinity says that uh, she's got an open contract and she'll face Giselle Shaw. After this was 
what I really thought was the best part of this show. Uh, Sammy Callahan and Rich Swan reflecting on the friendship over the last several years. And I thought this was necessary because people forget the backstory when they had the match at Slammiversary several years ago, which was the best Slammiversary they have done in, in forever. Um, actually, they had back-to-back good Slammiversaries because there was uh, Swan and Callahan, but then Callahan had that match with Pentagon too. So uh, there's a couple... It's possible one of those was, no, uh, let me think. It's possible one of them was Rebellion or something then. I don't know. I just know there was an era where we had, we we're just getting killer pay-per-views. And, um, you know, one of them was the Sammy Callahan and Rich Swan feud where they were, you know, basically grew up together as family. And I think that got lost in translation when he recruited Swan to, to join him against the, the design. This was really good. I mean, excellent. And it's the kind of thing I'm always asking for to to build feuds. Uh, when you just rely on backstage segments or wrestling, I, I can't get behind those. I can't get interested more often than not. But story, when you know, we talk about storytelling in wrestling. Well, tell stories. Tell actual stories. And giving us this backstory here, I I could do without the music. You know, I always can. But I thought it was just excellent. And it made me a little more interested in where this is going. Uh, I'm kind of over Sammy Callahan yelling into the camera. And the design with the red lights talking. You know, like this was just something different. It was a breath of fresh air in this whole feud. And we're going to see who their mystery partner is. I talk about who I think it'll be on Patreon. Um, and then we get Ace Austin. and uh, Well, he had Chris Bay in his corner. But it's Ace Austin versus Jason Hotch. I I had a good feeling Jason Hotch was going to win this match because they won the previous week. The reason I liked last week's episode was because people won matches and it felt like they had momentum coming out of them. It felt like they were getting ready to do something. You know, it wasn't 50-50 booking. Like, I mean, because we get a lot of that in Impact. And and, and when I say 50-50, it doesn't mean we don't get the same matches too often. But it means if Mike Bailey gets a win one week, or he, he loses one week, he'll win the next. He'll get it back. And uh, it might be two different opponents, but he he's going to get that win back. You know what I mean? So no one, no one has momentum ever. And there was just something about last week's episode, excuse me, <coughs> where I felt that when everyone won the matches, they had some kind of momentum. So I had a good feeling Jason Hotch was going to win here because they look like they're trying to, you know, build them up a little bit so they can challenge. The ABC. I th- if you want to be the Ace and Bay connection, that's fine. But ABC's gay. But anyway, and we know Impact. Uh, if they build someone up, they're going to challenge more often than not challenge for the title almost immediately. And that's where this is going. I mean, there's probably going to te- be a tag team title match. I don't think there's one at under siege with them. I don't even know if any of them are wrestling. But I could see them adding a tag team title match um, instead of building these guys up a little bit more. I can see him doing it, but I thought this was a decent match. Jason Hodge had an opportunity to work. You know, they gave him some time and uh, he got the win, you know, with the help of Brian Myers, but he did get the win. I never thought we'd be in a, in a day where Ace Austin and Chris Bay were like baby faces, you know? Um, But they're also two guys that I feel like there's no excuse that they're not main eventers for the company right now, especially Ace. And Ace did a lot of his best work as a heel. Um, so I'm I'm not like real into babyface Ace and babyface Chris Bay. But, you know, they're obviously in a good place being part of the Bullet Club. But I just felt that, um, you know, the best work is when they were, you know, heels. Just, just you know, how I feel. They Obviously, they have the Bullet Club popularity behind them. So that's what's more most important. 
at the end of the day. But yeah, Jason Hotch gets the win. They're probably going to wrestle for the title sooner than later. Let's be real. Then backstage, Champagne Singh and Shira with Steve Macklin. They're all wearing the same clothes that they wore last week. So Trinity has had multiple backstage segments, but she changes clothes every episode. Um, but then we get guys who are wearing the same same thing, you know, standing in the same place in the building. Uh, watching the Pop TV episodes and stuff like I've been doing lately, I've been trying to pinpoint where they lost the magic in the backstage segments. Because if you watched on Access and not on Access, God, no, on Pop, on Destination America, they would do the backstage angles. And they're still kind of doing the shaky cam, but it's it's something felt really real and raw about it back then. And I realized it's because they shot shot them from much further away. So it came off like the cameraman was walking around and happened to walk up on these guys talking. Where now the camera is right up in their grill. They're perfectly in, in the middle of the camera. You know, they're facing, half facing each other so they can be facing towards the screen too. And it's all real rehearsed, you know, as opposed to it looking like they're just being, they're just having a conversation and they're being overheard. It seems like they're performing for the camera. So that's where, that's what the difference is. Um, But Macklin was showing his appreciation for them taking out Heath. I don't know how that, affected the outcome versus Rhino, but he, you know, Macklin appreciated it. And I've been saying this week in and week out, Macklin um, with a security detail would be great. Pairing them with these guys, at least it's given them something to do when they're able to get on screen and you can't grow and improve if you're not on screen, but they just don't fit. They don't fit at all. And Macklin did not come off like a star on this episode. He just seemed like one of the guys. Um, and we're waiting for that moment where he just comes off like a like a freaking star, you know? Like the star he is. Then uh, Mean Gia, she caught up with Jordan Grace. And uh, man, Jordan Grace. So she was obviously preparing for her bodybuilding competitions. She, she got very thin. She People felt, felt she looked sick. And then... Over the past couple episodes, when she was able to put like enough of that weight back on, she looks like a star. She just looks incredible right now. But they're talking, talking about the last chance match with Donna Barrazzo. And then um, Alicia comes in screaming at the top of her lungs. And I know people don't care for Alicia's acting. But I think as a heel, it is a lot better. But I question if she is forcing the Boston accent because I don't feel like her th- accent is that thick and then she does some of these segments and it is just over the top and i know people from boston and you know it's not that thick uh but i feel like it's done on purpose and i don't think it's very necessary but um i th- i like this more than most people did because i like alicia but you know it's funny because we look at alicia and we're like god she's so tiny but her and grace are the same height and she's the same height as a few of the knockouts. I think she's even taller than one or two of them. But because she's so thin, <laughs> you know, like we 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 take her as like she's like, you know, Alexa Bliss or something, a little like Spitfire. But she's, you know, she's taller than that. But I think she does, is doing better as a heel. But yelling, like she was yelling entirely too loud. You know, that was like very um, 80s wrestling when it wasn't <laughs> wasn't really necessary. Then we have Trinity versus Kylan King. You know, I, I'm going to say this episode is probably better than last week. I know I said last week was the best one of the year. I think this episode was better because there was very little bad about it, you know, especially up to this point. So Trinity takes on Kylan King. This match is excellent. This was a great match, and the knockouts have been dominating the show ever since Steve Macklin became champion. So that is what they're doubling down on right now is the knockouts division, not their world champion. That's what they're choosing to do. It's clear. I can always appreciate a knockouts match that does not involve the world champion in it. Now, granted, Kylan King's a tag team champion. The title doesn't mean a whole lot. 
but it's, there's no world champion involved here. So I can always appreciate a, just a good knockouts match outside of those parameters. And this was excellent. <clears throat> now, my issue last week was when the Coven got the win, it, it continued the trend of what I felt on the show was all the winners coming off with some moment, momentum. But because their impact, they had to send Trinity down and give their rear view to Kylan King, leave Kylan King flat on her ass to go off the air. If you were going to send Trinity out there, I would have kicked their ass if I was Kylan. I would have had Kylan King kick her ass, build some sympathy for Trinity, make Kylan King look a little more dominant, especially because she just won a match and just wrestled a match. So she's tired. And then you go into this and there's a lot more heat behind uh, a lot more heat for Kylan King. And you, you know, you want to see Trinity get that come up and spit impact does not do that. They said, Hey, this person was in WWE. They are going to leave the episode on top. Um, and, and as I said earlier, I thought Penzer did a good job with Kylan King's entrance. You know, um, I don't, I don't understand why, like when you do a ring announcement, why don't you just, hey, so-and-so weighing in. I know they don't wait, do the women, but weighing in, it's so, in, you know, X and X pounds hailing from, I mean, there's this long entrance you can do. And um, I don't know why with, with Impact, they're just like, coming to the ring, Kylan King, you know, no, not throwing no nicknames in there, no nothing, you know, like you can really do something. But this was a really good match. And then she won with the star, the starstruck submission. Uh, I've never seen a submission because I hadn't watched WWE in so long, but I was, a, I, I thought, you know, that's a believable finish because the rear view is horrible. It is her ass hitting someone in the face and that's supposed to knock them out cold, you know? So, um, she, was able to put the submission on out of nowhere and Kylan King tapped. So very good match. What was not good. was Jay Vidal coming um, down the ring and I've been giving props to him. Like, I think he is really good in his role, but he comes down and he's trying to cut a promo and nobody cares in the crowd. I mean, it was dead. And the reason for that is because, and, and uh, Impact has this problem, is they build angles backstage, which is fine. And then you bring them onto screen, and the fans in the arena don't know what the hell's going on. And that's exactly what happened here. Why is Jay Vidal walking out and saying Giselle Shaw's mad? Like, we're, if I'm in the crowd, I'm like, we. I haven't seen Giselle Shaw wrestle this entire time we've been doing these tapings. What what the hell does she have to do with any of this? <clears throat> so the people didn't care. He came out to deliver a message saying that um, Giselle ex accepts the open contract. Again, the people in the arena don't know there's an open contract for uh, Trinity. And then he tries to do a fake slap. And uh, Trinity catches it and kicks his head off. What do we have after that, folks? Another angle that I thought was not good. Not an angle, I'm sorry, but it was a segment that I thought was not good. And it was Macklin, Singh, and Shiro walking in the dark and yelling, PCO! And then the camera turns and PCO is five feet away from them. Hanging out in a corner, back to the wall. And they start assaulting him, and they're giving him fake punches that aren't connecting. And then Shira, like, I think choke slams him onto the ground. And PCO, who doesn't really speak, starts yelling, my back, my back, sounding as human as you possibly can. Did not fit what they're doing with his gimmick. Now they're trying to sell the back get it but pco yelling my back community theater 
And then, uh, you know, Steve Macklin says, we're really going to fuck up his back. That's not what he said. But he puts a cinder block on him, takes a hammer, and they they break it over him. So we've seen these kind of things with PCO before. He just kind of kind of gets up. Uh, but I, I didn't like it. I didn't care for it. But I will say at least Macklin got the upper hand. Because last week when he started uh, opening the... The ambulance door to attack Rhino, I thought he should have really fucked Rhino up and got more heat. But then they had PCO magically appear in the ambulance and get one up on him, and I didn't care for it. At least here, Macklin gets the upper hand, but this is the 50-50 I'm talking about. One week, it's one guy. The other week, it's the next. You know, if one person is dominant, if the heel especially is dominant, then you're building sympathy for the baby face and you're establishing the heel as a heel. You're making the heel beatable or come off as beatable if he ends up on his ass at any point. Like when PCO is jumping him and attacking him and he's ended up on his ass, then he looks beatable. And that is just not the way, in my opinion, to do it. And no, again, everything up to Trinity really really good so no this was not better than last week's episode because as i keep moving and see these segments i was like we're going we're now going downhill at this point it was a very steep incline and now we're declining at a very rapid rate in in bags bad segments so the next bad segment was jessica being confronted by the coven and i'm like can this stop can all of them interacting with each other stop they are teasing the undead realm i don't know if they're trying to infer that they're going to go get taya because we know they're not so what the hell are they doing maybe it's not time maybe it's something else but this isn't good and just when it looked like with the coven they were starting to figure out their gimmick they're back here doing the silly shit and I got to say, Kylan King, I said when she wrestled a couple matches on BTI that I said, this is the exact kind of knockout they need. Now, I was already familiar with her with NWA, um, with AEW. I was familiar with her and always been a fan of hers. And every time she opens her mouth, she sounds great. She's natural. It's not community theater. You know, even with this silly coven gimmick. She sounds great. She looks great. She's going to be a real star for this division one day when she's out of this gimmick and she's wrestling singles. She might be a baby face. I don't know. But um, her time is going to come and she's going to be one of the real players in this division. She might be the person who ultimately replaces Jordan Grace one day if Jordan Grace were to move on, which I, I suspect will will happen one day. <clears throat> but all this, the black magic, and, and you know, we're all over this. We're all over it. Uh, but I guess they have to, I guess they feel the need to do this because they have to get Jessica back to Havoc, which is probably where this is going. So they probably feel the need. They can't just do nothing, you know, and, and then the Death Dolls wrestle every blue moon and the Jessica gimmick is still there and it's no longer over, you know. I don't know how over it was to begin with, but, you know, I guess they feel they, they have to do this. But that does not mean it's good. Then Jody Redhead, Jody Redhair, I mean, um, uh, who's the second red-haired knockout to wrestle on the show, in, swimming in a sea of red, is wrestling Sierra. They both get the same entrance, and... Um, I said last week or whenever it was last time Jody Threat wrestled, Jody Red Hair. I said I don't see anything in her that would be like we got to sign her to be a knockout. And I will say I'm still in that ballpark a little bit, but now I'm watching her. She comes running down to the ring and she's headbanging and it is different than anything anyone else is doing because if she's not doing that, she's not that far off from Killer Kelly and Masha. You know, there's not that much of a difference. Um, I mean, similar the, the red hair, very similar grays and blacks that they wear. But she's but she has, uh, 
you know, just the her presentation is is a little different, and it, it is starting to stand out. And she has this this finisher, the F four one six, and it just doesn't seem to connect very clean. I think she tries to throw them too far rather than kind of like Brock Lesnar keeps them keeps them hooked in a little bit. Rosemary did as well with the the red wedding, but she seems like she lets go of them, and it it, it comes off a, a little bit sloppy. I don't know where they go with Jody Threat. I don't see a feud for her. She had a little one with Alicia, and they killed it in two weeks. So I don't, I don't know what their, I don't know what the game is here. I don't, I don't see a knockout on the roster that she can have a meaningful program with. Then Eddie Edwards, he is backstage with Frankie Kazarian. I thought Frankie Kazarian. I, I would bet many of you thought this too. I thought he was sitting on the toilet taking a shit. It looked like he was sitting inside of a urinal. And Eddie comes in and my first thought was, wow, Eddie doesn't have green hair anymore. And then I see later that he does. I thought this was a decent little exchange. Frankie Gazarian sounded a thousand times more natural than Eddie. He's just light years ahead of him when it comes to speaking. Um, and Eddie's telling him, follow my lead tonight. We got to be on the same page. Now this telegraphs to me that, so I thought Frankie Kazarian was going to win the, the number one contender match. He was the only one doing anything important on the show, but it was the sit down segments, but I thought he was going to win. This tells me that Eddie and Frankie are, are going to have a program. That's where I'm going with where I think they're going. And Probably what they're going to do at the pay-per-view. So it kind of shifts my thought to maybe it is Alex Shelley who wins. And Chris Saban does take the L in the X division. I, I'm confident one of the one of the machine guns is winning their match. But <clears throat> I thought this was a nice little exchange with Frankie Kazarian. And then we start going downhill again because it's it is Dango. It is Swinger. It is Dice. And it is Joe Hendry. Now, I initially thought this was okay because I've actually kind of thought some of the things they were doing were funny with this, with uh, with Santino. But then Dango is making up a fake excuse or why he's got a problem with Joe Hendry all of a sudden because he's been on his nuts this whole time, right? I don't remember Joe Hendry standing in front of him and taking the shine. I, you know, and pro- and part of the problem is and I bring this up quite a bit, is that they don't let anything breathe on screen. They'll have a little something go on after the match, and the, instead of just taking those four, extra four or five seconds to explain what's going on a little bit, they play the video game sound and go into the next segment. They just abruptly, and they go into the next segment. So I, I didn't remember Joe Hendry in any way trying to steal the shine from Dango. I don't remember the announcer saying anything. Maybe they did. I just don't remember. It wasn't memorable. So it must mean it wasn't very good. And then, then Joe Hendry rips his shirt because they get into it. And there's a patch of chest hair missing. So when this whole who attacks Santino thing happened, there were people on Twitter comparing this to Killer Cross's debut. And I was like, this is not leading to a main event or debuting with the company. Think of all the players involved. They're all comedy. It's, it's, you know, I, what I say, I said it was like who shot Bravo more than it was Killer Cross. So they rip his shirt off and there's a patch of hair missing. And we forget that, in the beginning, they found a patch of hair at the scene of the crime when Santino, Santino was taken out. Why they even correlated that, that that patch of hair to someone who attacked them, I don't really know. But he's got this like patch of hair missing. And they immediately know at this point that he jumped Santino. This was horrible. The, the redeeming thing about this, you know, so that's why you were wrestling with a shirt last week and 
you're going to tell me over the course of a month that he didn't grow that chest hair back, that it's in that same giant patch, that that's what's missing. The only redeeming quality here is that Dango came off very serious. He didn't really have that goofy persona. He came off like a real heel. If this is leading towards him getting rid of the dancing gimmick, the, 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 the half-ass gimmick that he's doing of his WWE gimmick, if it's getting away from that and they're going to do something with him as a heel and a serious heel, now he's a funny guy, so he can incorporate a little humor in, but I mean, not the goofy humor. humor. If they're making him a real heel, then I have interest in this. But, you know, I, I tweeted out the photo. They're wrestling at under siege for the digital media championship. And I said, if you, if there was any questions on the legitimacy, legitimacy of this title, look at this match. And there's some people, Oh, one guy said, Oh, well, Joe Hendry has been the champion for X and X days and they're both decent workers. So this does mean something. It means Jack fucking shit. This title means nothing. And it's being defended against Dango. It means nothing. Now, I'm all for it meaning something, but they promised when this title came out that it was cutting edge, it was going to be different, it was going to be defended on Twitter, and it was going to have all these social media exclusive matches, and, you know, um, my homie TNA dude had told me, you know, this should be like a interactive title where, you know, the fans can vote on stipulations and, and vote on match rules and maybe who's in the matches like there's so much they can do that's not what this is it is a prop title so it is not prestigious i don't care if he's held it for four years straight it means nothing but if this is leading towards dango and a more serious character and if he even wins this title which i could see happening now i'm all for it you know but like right now this was very bad. This was a waste of our time. But let's see what the end game is here. Let's see what they're doing. If this is leading towards Dango versus Santino, I don't know how much I care about that. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <clears throat> Gosh, I'm sorry. I try my hardest not to cop on air, folks. You have no idea. And then we then it's that time of the show where we own the night plays for four minutes straight while they can run down every possible card next week's show and new Japan and, and uh, under siege. And I'm going to say it like I say it every week, every month, every year, when you play the card, change the music. When you play the card for the monthly special, change the music. It will change the dynamic of the announcers and how they deliver, you know, how they announce the matches it will make us feel something internally more excited because it's, you know, we own the night, and then next week, and then starts, you know, some real music hits and, and they start going through this under siege card. And, and now we feel like we might give a shit. And I know I say that every damn week, but it's like, I just want it to end. And I'm telling you people when I move, to Las Vegas, I will not see Impact in person. I don't care if they come to Sand Sound Casino. I will not come see them in person until they change the song. Because I know they play it in the arena every single time there's dead space. And there's time between matches they play the fucking song. I will lose my mind. So I will not attend an impact television event. And they've been pretty close to me and and some of these other, you know, Chicago and some of these other surrounding cities in the Midwest. Like I can go, I just drove four hours to go see the WNBA the other day on opening night, my team in Indiana. I'll drive four hours to go watch impact. I'm not going to drive four hours to listen to we on the night though. So that is a, that is the price of my ticket is change the song. Um, then it's the main event. But yeah, that that was just really bad. Um, I don't know. It, again, if Dango, if they're doing something with him, cool, you know. 
But yeah, I mean, next week they're going to have Rich Swan versus Angels. I'll look forward to that because they're two of my favorite wrestlers. Mike Bailey versus Chris Saban, I don't really care about just because I already know there's going to be a lot of choreographed moves in that match, and it's just not not my not my thing. Then we get Moose. The biggest wrestlers are on one side. Moose, Al Eddie Edwards, and Frankie Gazarian. They take on Jonathan Gresham, who's showing some heel tendencies, but not, not full steam yet. Jabba Mora and Alex Shelley. And I saw one of the Impact Delusionals on Twitter saying you can make a case for all six of these guys to be Impact World Champion, even Yuya. I would love to hear your case for why he should be the world champion. He has never beat anybody, and he probably never will beat anybody in his time in Impact. Is he talented? Does he have a nice looking cross body block? Yes. Does he win? No. He shouldn't even be on the winning team in this match, but he was. I will say I didn't care a whole lot about this match. What I did enjoy was Alex Shelley and Frankie Gazarian against each other. Their parts were really, really good. I don't know who's going to win this six-way because my initial selection was Frankie Gazarian. I'm starting to think it's Alex Shelley. Jonathan Gresham is a dark horse to win this thing if he's remaining remaining a baby face. But he showed some heel tendencies. It might have just been because of the way these teams were set up. But I also think that the feud with Mike Bailey is to lead towards them joining up as a tag team. Otherwise, why are they, why are they going to wrestle that many times? So we'll see. We'll see. Um, but, but Jonathan Gresham's kind of my dark horse to win this. I didn't really care about this main event. Uh, but Shelly pins Eddie Edwards with the shell, shell shock for three. And, and usually when someone wins... <laughs> And we think they got the momentum. They don't typically win at the the pay per view, so I really don't know where they're what they're gonna do. And that's kind of a good thing because a lot of the times they do these six ways and five ways and triple threat, whatever. And we know who's gonna be the number one contender. But this one, I don't really know. I would imagine it's not Moose Moose or Eddie Edwards because they're heels, but there's several baby faces in this match. If it is Jabba Mora, I will shut the podcast down. If that is the one match he wins, I will I will shut down shop. Because now we're not taking serious shit seriously anymore. But yeah, Gresham, Jabba Mora, excuse me, Alex Shelley win. Then Impact goes off the air. So, very good episode. There was a uh, a period where it just whatever they do we're doing these backstage segments I, all the way from Jay Vidal to uh, Dango the show was bad and then it kind of picked up again for the main event again not really my favorite main, main event in the world but but um pretty good so pretty good overall episode I can dig it impact um. I wish we would just get more episodes like this than some of the ones we get sometimes. I wish I wish things were a little more consistent because I felt the show was pretty consistent last year. It's this year for whatever reason that the consistency is not there. So thank you for swinging by, folks. I am your boy, BQ. We went about nine minutes longer this week than typical. I had a long opening, so if you're still here. Thank you for listening. I'm your boy. And I'm out. Peace.